I said, you little bastard, come in here. <laughs> Why is Jack always sitting? <laughs> so if you could just look this way, just check off the, just the lights and... First we're going to show a 12 minute video. sustainability, and intelligent planning can lead us into a marvelous new world of unlimited human potential. Designing the future. This vision could be a showcase of what the world can be in our cybernated age. Science and technology could be used for human betterment and the restoration and protection of the environment serving as an example of the intelligent application of a systems approach. While some people advocate the restoration of existing worn-out cities, these efforts fall short of the potentials of modern technology to attain a higher standard of living for all the city's occupants. The circular arrangement efficiently permits the most sophisticated use of available resources and construction learning center where people from all over the world visit and hopefully emulate this design approach in other parts of the transportation and its simplicity and durability. This will include the flexibility to permit ongoing and later changes. The city would function basic structural elements which are prefabricated in automated plants and assembled on site. Many of these buildings would be comprised of standard units that can be arranged to mission, entertainment, and conference centers. Lovely parks, lakes, streams, and waterfalls are located throughout the entire city. The central dome, or theme center, contains schools, healthcare, shopping, communications networking, and childcare. It is also the core for most transportation services, which move people by transveyors horizontally, vertically, and radially anywhere in the city. This minimizes the need for automobile transportation, except for emergency vehicles. Transportation between cities would be by monorail. The central dome will eventually house a cybernated complex, which serves as the brain and nervous system of the entire city. It projects a 3D virtual image of Earth using satellite communication systems, which display information on weather, agriculture, transportation, and the operation of the whole city. This cybernated... The Venus Project I wanted to thank everybody for coming here this afternoon. We really appreciate it. And I also wanted to give a special thanks to Andrew Wallace, who made all this possible, who organized this and put it on. And a special thank you to all the Zygites members, Navid and, and all the Zygites members from the chapters here that helped with this lecture as well. So we really appreciate it. Um, I don't know if all of you know, but all of the models, all of the designs that you saw in this video were done by Jacques Fresco. But unlike the film you just saw, we live in a world where our social systems are old. Our language is old. The way we acquire goods and services is outdated. 
and our cities are detrimental to our health and a tremendous waste of energy and resources and our politicians don't provide a way out of these problems. In other words, they don't serve us. Excuse me, a little technical problem here. Sorry. But our technology is racing forward. We're trying to adjust to the rapid advances in technology with obsolete values that no longer work in our technological age. What is needed is a change in our sense of direction and purpose, an alternative vision for a sustainable new world civilization unlike anything in the past. That's what we're presenting here, and we call it the Venus Project. And the activist arm of the Venus Project was organized by Peter Joseph, and that's called the Zeitgeist Movement. When I refer to sustainability, I'm not referring to sustainability for the banks that keep us in perpetual debt and keep countries in perpetual debt, nor the corporations or the obsolete social system that we live under. By sustainability, I mean the well-being of all people in a new system that would bring everyone to their highest potential while protecting and preserving the environment. What I am talking about is intelligently managing Earth's resources by using the methods of science to organize and manage society. I'm not referring to scientists running things, but the methods of, of science apply to the way we live to achieve a more humane society for everyone. We apply the scientific method in limited areas, in such things as the building of aircraft, skyscrapers, bridges, and automobiles. Over the centuries, we have developed a consensus that when it comes to matters of personal safety, we choose science and technology rather than primitive belief systems or politics because science has proven to work. Then why don't we use scientific scales of performance when it comes to planning our societies, our cities, transportation systems, and so on? If science has a lot to do with what works, then clearly there's much about today's society and economics that is not scientific because things aren't working for the majority of the world's people and the environment. If they were war, poverty, hunger, homelessness, and pollution would have been solved long ago. We have the technological ability and the resources to feed, house, clothe, and educate everyone on the planet. But our practice of rationing resources through the use of money never provided a means to do so. Then how do we even begin to solve our problems when we keep using the methods of the monastery system that we all live under? The use of money is hardly ever examined, but let's consider it along with how much it shapes and influences our behavior and our values. Money itself doesn't have any value at all. It has no gold or anything to back it up. It's just a, pic a picture on a cheap piece of paper with an agreement amongst people as to what it can buy. And I would say a forced agreement, because we don't really determine the prices of things. If it rained $100 bills right now, everybody would be happy except the bankers. So let's look at money. Money is just an interference factor between what you want and what you're able to get. People think in terms of wanting a job, to get the money to fulfill their needs. But if they really thought about it, it's not the money that we need or the job that they really want, 
but it's access to the necessities of life. The use of money results in social stratification and elitism. They say in America that all people are equal, but most people don't buy the kind of car or live in the kind of home that they want. They buy what they can afford. Many cultures tell their people that they are free, but we are really as free as our purchasing power. How can someone have freedom when they can't get the best medical care or best education for their children? Most people are slaves to jobs they don't really like only because they need the money. Many laws are enacted <clears throat> excuse me, for the benefit of corporations only because they have the money to persuade government officials to bribe them and to lobby to make laws to serve their own interests. People say that the monetary system produces incentive. This may be true, but to a limited extent. It also produces greed, corruption, crime, war, and poverty. You really have to look at the entire picture. The monetary system is based on artificial scarcity. For example, food products are sometimes destroyed just to keep the prices up. There's a tremendous waste of energy as a result of frequent superficial design changes to create a continuous market. This is really evident in the fashion industry. Our social system is based on the need to continuously buy. You and I in this system are merely consumers. There's a tremendous environmental degradation due to the higher cost of more appropriate waste disposal. In other words, the earth is being plundered for profit. The recent oil spill in the Gulf is a really good example of this. But one of the greatest wastes of resources and lives is the military. How shameful that it's one of our biggest industries in the world. It's little understood just how much our values are shaped by the monetary system. Our values are influenced by the media for the benefit of the establishment. We call them the unholy three. The military, the corporations, and the banks. Not many people get that. <laughs> For the most part, they determine the public agenda to serve their own self-interests. They perpetuate the illusion that society's values are determined by the ground up. They do this through empty words such as freedom, patriotism, and democracy. What we have all over the world is managed news for and by the establishment. They produce the books, the newspapers, the TV shows, the movies, the education, and the entertainment, which in turn helps to shape our values and behavior. In other words, we have an established society that works for a privileged few and gives us our values and behavior in order to keep things as they are. Most important, when the corporation's bottom line is profit, all decisions are made not for the benefit of people or the environment, but primarily for the acquisition of wealth, property, and power. For instance, if your country really cared about you, they wouldn't outsource jobs for lower wages elsewhere. What if all the money in the world suddenly disappeared? As long as we had arable land, factories, technical personnel, and other resources existed, we could build anything we wanted to build and fulfill most of our needs. The Venus Project advocates that with today's ingenuity, we could easily overcome scarcity 
which is the cause of most of our problems, such as war, corruption, and aberrant behavior. We could accomplish th this through the implementation of a resource-based economy. This is a very different concept than anything that's gone in the past. It has nothing to do with communism, socialism, capitalism, or fascism. To put it simply, a resource-based economy uses resources rather than money, and all people have free access to their needs without money, credit, barter, taxation, or any other kind of debt or servitude. In other words, all the world's resources are held as the common heritage of all the Earth's people. The real wealth of any nation is not its money, but its resources and the people who work toward the elimination of scarcity for a more humane society for everyone. If you still have problems with this, if it's still confusing, consider this. If a group of people were stranded on, the, on an island with money, tons of gold, and diamonds, and the island had no arable land, no fish, no clean water, their wealth would be irrelevant to their survival. Money is not what people need, but rather it's access to the necessities of life. In a resource-based economy, resources are used directly to enhance the lives of all the world's people. If we manage our resources wisely, we could easily produce the necessities of life and provide a very high standard of living for everyone on the planet. This may be hard to believe, but even the wealthiest of today would have a much higher standard of living within a resource-based economy. When science and technology are unleashed into society to improve everyone's lives without restrictions of money, the marketplace, or patents, we could really begin to know what it means to be human and be civilized. In a resource-based economy, children would be taught to be problem solvers instead of the parasitic professions within the monetary system of today. These professions do not contribute to the well-being of people. These would be fields such as advertising, insurance, real estate, law, banking, politics, and sales, just to name a few. I hope I haven't upset too many of you with that. When all the Earth's resources are shared, there would be no need for the military. This savage profession can easily be surpassed in a resource-based economy. These people are trained merely to be killing machines. How wonderful it would be if they were sent back to school and trained to be problem solvers instead and learn how to bridge the difference between nations without killing or violence. When all the Earth's resources are managed and shared as the common heritage of all the world's people, the artificial barriers that separate nations would no longer be necessary. Invasions of countries purely for resource theft will be a thing of the past. And that's why we really invade other countries. It's not to bring democracy and freedom as they tell us in the United States but it's really to grab resources, cheap labor, or a route for oil. In a resource-based economy, instead of fighting one another over scarce resources, people will be working towards solving problems that are common to everyone, such as the risk of heart disease, or cancer, or the threat of tsunamis, earthquakes, and so on. Remember that all new ideas and new concepts were ridiculed, rejected, and laughed at when they were first presented, especially by the experts of the times. All new ideas for social betterment, including women's rights, 
black rights and child labor have always been met with great resistance. During the time of the Wright brothers, the distinguished scientists of the day were writing books exclaiming why man can't fly. The Wright brothers didn't read their books and went right ahead and built the flying machine. When science is applied with human and environmental concern to the way we live, we can easily create abundance for all. We will eventually understand that most criminals that fill our jails are a result of the need for money and property in an age of often contrived scarcity of the monetary system. Children will look back and wonder why we couldn't see the limitations of this vile system. Being civilized is an ongoing process. There's no utopia and no final frontiers. All things change. We are in a continuous process of social evolution. Most countries, excuse me, those countries that try to freeze and keep things as they are will be surpassed. Thank you. thank all of you for coming and doing the work you're doing to inform other people. Of course, I'm going to say a lot of things. Can I put this on you before you start? Yes. Sure. Just there. I think I've got one here. I'm going to say a lot of things. Is it turned on? Can you hear me back there? I'm going to say a lot of things that may bother some of you, but please be patient. I'm not your enemy. I'm going to tell you things that, about your society that you may or may not know. I want to say first that the language we speak was designed hundreds of years ago, and it's almost impossible to talk to one another. Although we think we talk to one another, we really repeat a language that's highly insufficient. Whatever you say to other people, it goes in their heads and comes out to fit their society. You don't always communicate with people. So the problem is, can we develop a language that has consistent meaning? Well, if you still don't understand me, sometimes I might say, have a nice weekend. Why don't we say, have a nice life? Why just the weekend? Our language, again, is old. Is it possible to devise a language that's not subject to interpretation? When you read the Bible, if you do, it says Jesus meant this, somebody says that. Oh no, he meant that. The third person says, you're both wrong. This is what he really meant. So you have the Lutheran, the Seventh-day Adventist, the Catholic, because it's subject to interpretation. The language of chemistry, mathematics, science, engineering is not subject to interpretation. When a chemist writes a formula, no matter what country it goes to, they interpret it the same way. I'm trying to tell you it's possible to develop a language that's not subject to interpretation. So we really talk at each other rather than to one another. That's a major problem. That's why lawyers exist. They can take language, mold it, reshape it, but you can't do that. Those of you that want to know how to communicate, there are books such as Science and Sanity by Alfred Korzybski, Language and Thought and Action by Hayakawa, The Tyranny of Words by Stuart Chase. You don't even know this, but the words you use have no communication value. Take junior grade school, for example. When a teacher says to a child, that's wrong, that doesn't tell a child anything. Think about it. That's wrong. What does that tell you? Nothing in particular. And the teacher says, that's not what I told you. That doesn't tell the child anything. 
So most of our language is empty. Then there's another bullshit word, and that's love. Don't get mad at me, hear me out. Now most of us don't like everything we've done in life. I'm sure we don't. We made mistakes, we made false judgments. So sometimes you like yourself, sometimes a little bit, sometimes not at all. So love is a fluctuating thing. Even if you marry somebody and love them, you'll find sometimes you love them very much, little less, sometimes how do I ever get in this situation? <laughs> so love is a fluctuating thing, not a fixed thing. That's why we don't understand what's happening. Sometimes a guy is conditioned by society to like a girl of a particular configuration. But he marries a girl of a different configuration. And he's always looking at different configurations. And you think, hey, what the hell's the matter with this guy? Nothing's the matter with him. He was brought up that way. There are no good or bad people. There are no creative people or lazy people. All that is bullshit put out by your country. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. If you were raised by the headhunters of the Amazon, you'd be a headhunter. And if I said to you, doesn't it bother you to have five shrunken heads? You say, yes, my brother has 20. <laughs> so, is he nuts? No, that's normal to his culture. If you were brought up in ancient Rome, assuming you were Christian, the Romans believed in many different gods and you come up with one god, you must be nuts. So they put you in an arena with a lot of hungry lions, and they'd starve the lions for a week to put on the good show. Then they'd take the clothes off the Christians, so the lions could tear at them easy. The whole family would come Saturday and Sunday to see Christians fed the lions. And the kids would say, Daddy, can I come next week to see Christians fed the lions? That is, if you behave yourself. Now, are these people nuts? No. That's normal to that culture. Just as we go to prize fights and watch men punch the heads of other men. All the things we do are stupid and far beyond civilization. We are not civilized yet. That's why you have prisons, police, war, and all the problems you have. Unnecessary human suffering because people don't understand yet. Their schools do not educate people. They teach you to become a cog in the wheel, as Roxanne pointed out. They teach you to become a carpenter, an engineer, an architect. All these are false fields. They have to teach you how to become a generalist, how to understand the history of civilization, which is lacking in all our universities. They'd be shut down in the future and people will be brought up to become generalists. So they understand human behavior, they understand what makes a person, what gives a person drive. So all of us are brought up to believe there are different kinds of people, which is a lie. That the Japanese mind can't grasp technology. That the Chinese can't understand certain things. And always get a dumb Polak to clean out your cellar. <laughs> and the damn Italians, the wops they brought, they mafia to this country. And all that hatred comes from cheap labor. As rule, when the Irish first came to this country, they worked for one half the amount Americans worked for. So let's get rid of those damn Irishmen. They're no good. Huh. They took their jobs away. That's why we got mad at them. And during the Depression, at the factory put up a sign, Help Wanted, everybody lined up to get a job. Hundreds of people. And normal Americans, normal means fucked up. Normal Americans would say, let's get the goddamn Wops out of the line. Let's get the goddamn Filipinos out of the line. Because they threaten our jobs. That's why they do that. Racial hatred, hatred is tolerated and brought about. But I want to tell you this. If a normal American baby or a Greek baby or a French baby were brought up in Nazi Germany, and all they see is Heil Hitler, Deutschland over alles, Germany above all. They become Nazis. If you brought up in America, you become, yes sir, I'm an American and proud of it. Most Americans don't know that George Washington, the first president, had 300 slaves. Today be arrested as a nut. 
And the most of the people, Harry Truman, President Truman, was a hat salesman, real jackass in presidential position. Now, who are these people in government? What is a politician? I don't want you to take my word. I want you to walk over to any politician you know or do not know and ask them, how can you grow food faster without exhausting the soil and feed the hungry? I don't know. How can you make automobiles that don't hit each other? I don't know. How can you make highways safer? I don't know. They don't know anything. Don't take my word for it. Ask them. They really don't know a damn thing, and I mean politicians all over the world. All countries, all, are basically corrupt. If you don't understand what I'm saying, where do you think America got America from? You think the Indians just come on over, enjoy yourself, take all the land you want? No, we killed thousands of Indians. We starved 50 million buffalo to make it tough for the Indians. And the Indians that fought back really tried to take some land back, but the government decided that they wanted to get rid of those aggressive Indians that wouldn't conform to what we wanted. So they offered 10 bucks for every Indian you killed. And the guy walked over and he said, I just killed 10 Indians. The government said, how do we know that? Bring back a piece of the Indian. So they started scalping. Americans, not the Indians. And we brought back 10 scalps to collect 10 bucks for every Indian you killed. Americans are no good. French are no good. The Greeks are no good. All nations are corrupt. They say the sun never sets on England. Where do you think England got all that land from? They took it by killing thousands of people. So, if you don't like the guy next door, if you shoot him and miss by one inch, you're not a murderer. If your aim is a little better, you're a murderer, if you hit the guy. So, today they have guns, machine guns with laser beams. When it's on you and you pull the trigger, bullets come out. If it's a little off, no bullets come out. The guns are getting smarter, soldiers are getting dumber, and they're killing, they're killing machines. We would train soldiers to be problem solvers, send them back to school. How do you bridge the difference between nations? How can we improve agriculture? How can we fight hurricanes, heart disease? This is a real problem, not killing. When you kill people and bomb cities, consider the abortionists. Some people say, gee, that's terrible. They commit abortion, they take a life. If these people were consistently educated, when you have war, you kill pregnant women, children, everybody, why don't they fight against war? Why just abortionists? There's something dreadfully wrong with all our schools. They have better equipment than ever, the universities, the best, and the wars are getting worse. The atom bomb is considered nothing today compared to the cobalt bomb. It'll kill many more people. Each submarine, I'm talking about America, it's the only country I have information on, has 300 submarines. According to the Navy, each one has more destructive power than all the wars in history. What can you accomplish with that? Then they tell you other things. They tell you things like, be good, be kind. How can you be kind or good? Suppose I have a factory and I turn out things 10 times faster than your factory. Same product. If I share that with you, I lose the competitive edge. If I have patents, I deprive people all over the world from making things that make life better. So how can you be decent? So you go to church on Sunday, and what do you do there? You look at the clothes of other people, everybody dresses to outpace the other person. And so when they go to church, what do they do mostly? Bother God. We need a new car. My wife needs a car. I'd like a home in the country, and I'd like this, I'd like that. And they say that God knows everything. That's what they teach you in church. God knows everything. He made every planet, every galaxy. So when I went to church, I insulted the minister by saying, if God knows everything, why did Jesus insult God? He said, I don't remember Jesus insulting God. Well, they crucified Jesus. 
Just before they crucified him, he looked up and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And God said, gee, I didn't know that, thanks. <laughs> you know, if he knows everything, what is Jesus talking to him about? <laughs> what are you talking to him about if he knows everything? And then he is sick, he's suffering, please ease the pain. Well, I didn't know about that, and many, okay. So, you see, man makes God in his own image. Some jerk that gets angry and says, Noah, build yourself an ark, I'm going to flood the whole area, I don't like the products I turned out. He's going to kill everybody, so Noah is to build an ark. If he took two kinds of every animal, the ark would be about a mile long. Who cleans the shit out of that boat? <laughs> the stories are so ridiculous, they're not even sensible. So when I read the Bible instead of the comic strips, because there's nothing in it that makes sense. God sits on the throne, he makes a man and a woman, puts them in a beautiful garden, and then he has a snake that walks upright, according to the Bible, not me. And the snake says, eat of the fruit of knowledge. And Eve did that, and he kicked them both out and slammed at the gate shut. All loving, all kind God. The contradictions are so thick in the Bible, it's amazing that everybody doesn't see it. Now, in the Bible, if you're religious, it says, thou shalt not kill. It doesn't say you can kill Wednesdays and Thursdays. It says, thou shalt not kill. Then it says, love thine enemy, meaning if a man strike you, turn the other cheek. And what happens in times of war? What's the matter with these Christians? Larry King once said, what do you think of Christianity, Fresco? This is a great idea. When are they putting it into practice? Frankly, I've never met a Christian that forgives people, that loves their enemy, that turns the other cheek, that has no locks on the door. When a hungry person knocks, they bring him in saying, do unto the others that you have others do unto you. I've never met a Christian. Never found one anywhere I've traveled. So the point is, all of us need security. All people all over the world need clean air, clean water, arable land, and a relevant education. What does relevant education mean? To study agriculture, nature, how we relate to nature, how we relate to one another, to give us the tools to live in accordance with what we want, not what they want you to be. They want you to be patriotic. That means they want to control you. Patriotism, Einstein said, is a disease. But he couldn't say that publicly. When he came to this country, he was a socialist to America. And they said, don't talk socialism, they'll ship your ass back to Germany. So he wouldn't talk about it. Einstein, I once asked him whether he felt uh, that social design would be prevalent for all people, useful. He said he was a socialist, he really didn't know the anatomy of social design. He said, are you interested in mathematics? I said, yes, as a tool, but he didn't really know the process of social design. I asked communists, how will you prevent corruption in the future? They said, well, when that time comes, this is in the Great Depression, that time comes, we'll work on it. I said, well, how will you house the millions of people well, uh, uh, when that time comes, we'll work on that. I said, well, let's start a technical branch of the Communist Party or Socialist Party or any party to make life secure for all people so no one can become corrupt. They said, you're deviating from the teachings of Marx. You'll have to leave. I was not trying to deviate or disrupt communists. I was trying to give them a method of solving problems. So I joined, at that time, during the Depression, I joined technocracy because they talked about using science and government. But there were no blacks in the organization. And I said, how come there's no blacks? They said, well, let them start their own section. I said, well, what about Orientals? Does the Oriental mind can't grasp technology? Well, of course, as you know today, they lead the world in robotics. 
So all our thoughts about different kinds of people are lies. They're not real. We have to understand that all people tend to love their kids. All people want their kids to be better educated. All people want to know about nutrition. So let's say the drug companies were really sincere and they found out that celery juice lowers blood pressure. You can't make any money selling celery juice, could you? But you can get two bucks for every pill you sell. So there was a book written many years ago. I also like to know how many people ever heard of it. A hundred million guinea pigs. How many of you heard of that book? It should have been in every library. It's not. What did a hundred million guinea pigs talk about? The lies put out by the drug companies. And the people of America was the best seller, by the way, in America years ago. And they demanded that the government put in a Pure Food and Drug Administration to check the claims of the drug companies. And they did. They got that in. Now it's run by people of the drug company. Everything becomes corrupt. Everything we touch. So Oppenheimer went to visit Harry Truman, President Harry Truman, and said, look, now that we have an atom bomb, why don't you demonstrate it about 30 miles out at sea so the Japanese can see it, so you won't have to drop it over Japan. Give them a chance to surrender. Harry Truman said, get out of my office. I never want to see you guys again. And they dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima, Nagasaki, because he was a jackass. Most presidents are very stupid people. They know nothing about ecology, the evolution of society, or have ever, no politician, has ever increased the agricultural yield, made automobiles safer, airplanes safer. What the hell are they doing there? How do they get the job? There's something dreadfully wrong with education. The people in Washington, I can only talk about them, I believe all countries are similar. The people in Washington should know more about human behavior, the latest technologies. They tell you if you want freedom, write your congressman. Why do you have to write him? He should know all those things. When you fly on an airplane, you don't have to write the pilot, so you've been flying at an angle for half an hour, straighten up. <laughs> they know their business. The same for government. They should know everything about modern technology, human behavior. When you put a man in prison, say he stole a watch that cost $150, and it's the fourth time he committed that crime. So you put him in jail for seven years, that's a hell of a lot of watches you can get. Figure the cost of that. Feeding them medical care for seven years. Let them have the watch. It's much cheaper to give people things they need than to kill them. It's much cheaper. Think of men in jail for life. You know how much that cost? They're worried about the fact that he tried to rob a jewelry store of maybe three or four hundred dollars. It's always cheaper to feed people. And when they go to jail, I can assure you, they don't come out any better. They call them correctional institutes. They don't even know how to correct people. They're not people trained in that area. Then you've got a bunch of people they call psychologists. I hope there's none here today. And psychiatrists that adjust you to this fucked up culture. How can you adjust people to this culture if you're sane? Do you understand what I mean? So even psychologists and psychiatrists are part of the culture. So is religion. Jesus needs money. Jesus doesn't need anything. God doesn't need anything. They also try to tell you that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. According to the Bible, it says they crucified Christ, he arose and ascended into heaven. Where's the sacrifice? Think about it. So, we don't think about what we read, we just read and we just yak. And so, when we're asked to vote for somebody, we vote for somebody that fits the patterns we've been brought up to accept. Now, during the question period, please, don't be polite. If I say anything you don't understand, say, I don't get it. And if I fail to answer your question, say, you didn't answer my question. Don't be polite. So at the question period, we will examine some of the ideas 
and I want you to ask all kinds of naughty questions. Don't accept a thing I say. I don't want you to follow me. I want you to listen to what I say. If it makes sense, do it. If you like the Venus Project, when you leave here, if you don't talk to other people about it, nothing will happen. So if you like what we stand for, look, it's not perfect. It's just a lot better than the society you live in. And it'll continue to get better. There are no final frontiers. People think I'm a utopian. I believe that you can make the best of all possible worlds. I don't. Even if I design a city that works, that city will be a straitjacket to the kids of the future. They'll design their own cities. If you make a statue of me and put it in a city, that holds people back. <laughs> in order to move forward, you have to look at things, examine it, improve it, and move on. History is very poor. You don't learn much from it. If you study history exclusively, you won't come up with new ideas. We want to move on. There's no such thing as utopia. Every city I design would be the best I know up to now. And as time goes on, you learn more and the city changes. Nothing can be frozen and kept that way. Everything keeps changing. There are no final frontiers. That's what's the matter with heaven. It's fixed. Everything is the same way. Just consider this. If you went to heaven and you looked down and saw starving kids in Africa, war on earth, would heaven be a peaceful place for you? Absolutely not. There were a bunch of angels that turned against God, so he kicked them all out. They're called the fallen angels. If he didn't have peace up there, how the hell are you going to have it down here? You have to read your Bible and you have to be ruthlessly honest. If you're not honest, it won't work. It says in the Bible, judge not, lest you be judged. That means don't judge anybody. You don't know enough about what made him that way. It also says in the Bible, therefore, by the grace of God, go I. That's anybody you see in a wheelchair, blind, all of us. That can happen to all of us. They don't know what to do about it. In 1927, I came up with a little idea which I got from bats. Bats can fly at night and not hit anything. How do they do it? By sound. So I made a little gadget that would fit over a person's ear and generate sound waves so you can hear an open door even though you're blind. You can hear an object in front of you by sound feedback. So we can build things in all cities so the blind, the blind don't need that white stick or a dog or anything like that. In the meantime, we'll work on artificial systems of vision. I think that human beings can solve any problem. If you don't understand me, I'm not upholding Germany this time. Some people think I do. We formed a blockade to prevent the Germans from getting rubber, but they had enough technicians to make synthetic rubber. So they made all the rubber for their airplanes, everything out of their own chemistry. So, with technicians, not in charge. Understand, I don't want to see science in charge of government or technicians. What I want to see is their assignment to problems such as agriculture. When you, when you can grow food twice as fast on the soil, you exhaust the soil. So we want to know how to grow food faster without exhausting the soil. The United States Army dumped 65 tons of nerve gas into the ocean off the coast of Miami, near the Gulf Stream. How can you love the country if the army did that? They don't know what they're doing. They say, we want you to dump nerve gas. Yes, sir. We don't want obedient people anymore. We want you to understand what's happening. We don't want you to vote for a senator or some other jackass. They are incompetent, all of them. I want you to understand Everything that you have today is your electric lights, your airplanes, your automobiles. You had nothing to do with them. You got them just being born in a country that had that technology. You got it for nothing. I don't think any of you here worked on the electric light or radio or television. Very few people. So you got all that for nothing. Does it hurt you? Of course not. They said, well, you don't want to give people things for nothing, do you? This kid said that to me at Princeton University. 
Fresco, you want to give people things for nothing. So I said, are you paying your way through college? He said, no, my dad is. I said, does that hurt you? This kid said to me, he still doesn't believe anybody ought to get things for nothing. So I said to him, well, as I understand, your father is wealthy. If he dies, you want his money to go to the heart fund and the cancer fund, but not to you, because you don't believe anybody ought to get anything for nothing. He said, just a minute now. <laughs> Everybody wants things for nothing. You got the earth for nothing. You were born here, beautiful scenery, clouds. You didn't make any of that. Does it hurt you? Of course not. But when you're born in a polluted world with smog in the air and automobile pollution, say, I guess that's the way it is. It isn't that way. It's because the people in charge of government are totally incompetent. So what you really want is a world free, free of burden, pain, prisons, police, crime. Can we do that? The church has been trying to do it for years. They don't know how. They have no idea of how to say, be kind, be good. How do you do that? So I wanted my children, two of them, to learn how to read. So I never taught them how to read. I'd open a book at night and I'd read to them in bed. I'd read to them about things kids are interested in. This happened to be my son. He was about four years old. I was reading about dinosaurs. And I said, when the two dinosaurs met, I go, I said, that's all for tonight. And I close it. He said, what happened when the dinosaurs met? I said, look, if you learn to read, you can figure it out for yourself. <laughs> and so I gave him a reason to want to read. Don't just teach him to read. Teach him a reason for wanting to learn mathematics. Teach, his, teach you how to read the dicky dare on and his sheep. On the way he met a cow. Moo, moo, said the cow. What is that crap? <laughs> and then they have in America, I don't know how much you have it here, the Mickey Mouse Club. Now what the hell happens if you condition kids to join the Mickey Mouse Club? You make a bunch of pinheads. <laughs> Do you understand? Kids want to know everything. How do airplanes fly? Daddy, what makes the light go on? He said, I don't know that. Daddy usually doesn't know anything, and congressmen know less. <laughs> so I'm saying everything that you have is technical. Think about it. If we took away technology, if you shut down Boulder Dam tomorrow, all the food and all the refrigerators from L.A. to San Francisco would fail. All the food would rot away. Everything that you have is technology. If you shut down the power projects, men would have to pull cars and boats. They did it in the Volga River. They had to pull freighters. Men, slaves, were whipped to do that. Slavery was normal in the old days. And kings felt that they were put here to rule over people. People in my position like to think that they're here to try to make the world a better place. Divine wisdom guides them. Look, divine wisdom doesn't guide anybody. When Christians fed the lions, they prayed like hell. The Jews in concentration camp prayed and they were burned. In Salem, Massachusetts, if a woman spoke up and she didn't quite agree with everything, she was burned alive as a witch. Now here's what you didn't know. I'm talking about the United States. Women, hundreds of them were burned alive because they thought about things, just a little different. But the, what you didn't know is for every witch you found, you inherited their bank account and their land. So it was a good job looking for witches in the old days. The more you can find, the more money you got, and free. So here you have a world that's sicker than shit. And when I say that, I mean it. I mean that the world you live in is consisted of stupid people, including the military. The Pentagon and Washington think that they're there to defend the country. Whatever a man can think of, some other body can think of a way around that. You can't secure yourself. You think that you go to an airport, you put your luggage down, they x-ray it, and you're all right. I can design clothing that gives off nerve gas there are other ways around anything a person could think of. I wouldn't do that, of course. I wouldn't work on weapons. When I was drafted in the army, the first thing they said, 
Said, Can you make a bomb fresco that goes sideways instead of up? I said, I have no idea how to do that. It says, casting not pearl before swine. People are not educated yet. They should not have weapons of mass destruction. They don't know how to use it. They should have technology that enhances all human life. This is what religion tries to do. I would say that the Venus Project is the nearest thing to the brotherhood of humanity. And I want again thank you for your attendance and I want you to understand during the question period not to be polite. So Roxanne and I... Do you have about 15 more minutes or so? If you can go on. I do? Okay. Thank you. So I want to try to tell you a little more about people. If you were raised in Nazi Germany as a baby, if you never saw anything else, it'd be Heil Hitler. If you're raised in France, La Tour Eiffel, your facial expressions, everything. If you're raised in the South in America, you speak with a Southern accent. If I say, stop speaking with a Southern accent, you can't. And you'd say, well, I'm going to get me a nigger and I'm going to kick his ass. Is that you speaking or is that picked up from your environment? If you take a normal boy and bring him up with six or ten very effeminate women, Women speak differently than men. They move their hands a lot, and facial expressions are different, more like I'm moving now. So if you just were brought up with those words, a boy would move just like a woman. If you were brought up in Italy, you'd say, come on, they eat, there's a good food. See, because even that is reflection. If you're brought up in Germany, again, it's Deutschland over alles. If you're brought up in, in any other country, you might say, you know where the person was brought up from by the way they speak. How are you, mate? You know where that guy comes from Australia. How are you, mate? Well, you'd speak that way, your facial expression would be that way, and you use words like individuality. There's no such thing. Everybody reflects their culture. If you lived in France 10 years, you moved to Germany, you lived there 10 years, you speak with a German-French accent. Not a thing you can do about it. So we reflect our culture, all of us. So when they say, think for yourself, you can't. Because you think as an American, or a Frenchman, or a German, or a Greek, or an Italian. So really, when Germans speak, they speak when they come to this country. They speak and say, well, I give you some idea of what happened. That's the way they speak. They pick it up. It's a course between German and English. I worked for a guy named Ernst Judet, who was an ace of World War I. He shot down 71 planes. Since I worked for him, I said, how did you shoot down 71 airplanes? Maybe if he shot down five or six, that's possible. But how can you shoot down 71 airplanes? He said, what's very easy, Frasco. That's the way he spoke. He said, I would fly above the squadrons and I'd look for a rookie, a bad pilot that didn't know how, and I'd pick him off. So is he a good man? Is he kind? Is he human? Same with Eddie Rickenbacker. They always fly above the squadron and look for guys that can't fly too well and pick them off. That gives you a lot of medals, a lot of X's on your fuselage. So when you're brought up, you're brought up, so a lot of people go to church and says, thou shalt not kill. And so it's hard to get people to enlist in the army. So they give Japanese or Chinese Americans false teeth. And they make a movie by Frank Capra called Why We Fight. And it shows these Japanese kids raping a woman. And the enlistment goes up 75%. You have to teach hatred to have war to be, war to be a working system. And army men, unfortunately, Ten years after the war, that's the most exciting time of their life. And they always go back and they join the American Legion and they talk about the days they shot these goddamn slanty eye bastards. And the Germans were called Krauts, not human beings. So we shot them too. See? So soldiers are killing machines. And if you want a world without war, people have to be educated to understand that all people need the same thing, good food healthy living, a relevant education, not killing. Because war only produces hatred over the years. They remember that you kill their kids, their parents. 
and they want to get even with you. And some people say to me, I'm just imitating them. Why are these goddamn North Koreans building rockets and why are these Chinese building big armies? They're a threat to us. But again, I don't want to take my word for this, there's a newspaper in England called The Telegraph, The London Telegraph. And in that newspaper, they ran a headline about seven years ago. The U.S. intends to bomb seven countries, nuclear bomb, sneak attack on seven countries. It names North Korea, China, all the countries we don't like. Headlined in the Telegraph, you haven't seen that, so write for it, don't take my word for it. When you do that, if China said, we intend to bomb England, France, United States, and some other country, we would arm to the tooth. That's why they're all building nuclear weapons. They're afraid of us, afraid of America. You didn't know they ran that, so you say, why are these damn Chinese doing that? Why are these damn North Koreans doing that? They're doing it because they're scared of the United States. And the United States, are their intentions good? They may be, but they're stupid people. Even if they intended to do that, they should not have released it. It was released by the Pentagon, according to the Telegraph. So there's your reason. People behave as they've been conditioned, as they manage news and turn you off from things they think you ought not to hear. Like the theory of evolution was held back for a long time. And in all the parks in America, or most of them, there are cannons, war tanks, airplanes. There should be statues of people that increase food, that did wonderful changes in medicine, wash your hands, retain cleanliness. They used to cut cadavers and then go on right on and do childbirth with surgery. And the women would die of childbirth fever. That was because they did cutting with cadavers, never wash their hands, and the doctor that told them to wash their hands was kicked out of the university because he told them to wash their hands. So who the hell are you to tell us what to do? So everything new was fought, women's rights, child labor, they used to use children in factories. Of course, it's a little before your time. But people marched to get the children out of the factories and they had rotten eggs thrown at them. When you fought for women's rights, the same thing, they had rotten eggs thrown at you. What do you mean women? Women are only good for two things, you know. So they had notions about women. You know, women can't learn to be architects and engineers. Women are just good to produce babies and cook for the old man. Well, all this crap is disappearing, but every inch of the way of progress was fought. Just remember that. Nothing comes easy. People are now producing articles about the Venus Project because we're better known now. They said, Fresco gets his money from the Vatican, or the Rothschild family, or this banking institute. I don't have any money. Fresco has two Mercedes. I don't even have a car. So anyway, they will spread whatever rumors they have to, to keep in power. And that's what you're up against. Whenever you do anything new or different, instead of people saying, you know, that's an interesting thing, let me think about it, you know. They get mad at you because you're upsetting the apple cart. And that's what it's about. We have a tough job ahead, all of us. If you wish to live in a world without war, poverty, unemployment, hunger, human suffering, you have to talk to other people. If you do nothing, I can assure you nothing will happen. So I think I can open this portion to questions. So Roxanne and I, We'll take questions from any one of you. Thank you again. Um, you speak about science and technology looking ahead. There is aspects of science like archaeology and ethno whatever that looks back to rescue knowledge that has been quite advanced. Like in Crete, they had a culture of peace for like a thousand years. Like uh, pre-Inca agriculture knew about cultivating in different Andrew. cultural Andrew. ecological niches. Andrew? Therefore, therefore, it's not maybe looking ahead and not all cultures are based 
on stupidity, but some learning took place that it's worth rescuing. So what do you comment on that? Could you hear that question? The mic was just resonating a lot. I don't really understand what the question was, actually. Can you just ask, the, the mic was resonating a lot. Can you just come right to the point of the question? Yeah. Science looking back, not just forward, to rescue learned techniques, technology, science. For example, uh, pre hispanic pre inca agriculture, knew how to cultivate all the way from 3,000 meters to sea level, for example. So this um, cache of peace in Crete, there were 1,000 years of a cache of peace. So it's something to learn from the past as much as from the future. He's talking about some of the old civilizations you can learn from the past as well as the future. Well, without specific information, I really can't address that question. It has to be specific. If you just try to pinpoint the question, like who makes the decisions? What if a person doesn't want to live in your society? You know, just pinpoint it. Try not to wander all over the place. Otherwise, it's difficult for me. Besides, these hearing aids don't work that good. So Roxanne will have to tell me sometimes what your question is. Thank you. And I think you, you're just making a comment in terms of technology in the past. Certain people had, had different knowledge back then that was more helpful. Not just looking into the future, he's talking about it. But I think our technology in a lot of ways have far surpassed some of the technologies, the, most of the technologies in the past. But there is a lot to learn from certain primitive cultures. Jacques had an experiment, an experience. You want to talk about the experience in the, in the islands? I think I may have covered it. When I was 21, I went to the South Seas to see what people would be like. Can you hear me back there? And uh, when I got to a, a group of island called Tuamotu, when I landed there, I brought mirrors and beads to give to the natives. But they were already in my hut giving out my mirrors and beads. So I said, you know, what's going on? They said, you have too many. I did have a lot of mirrors and beads. But it took me three days later when the old folks pulled in a net full of fish they threw fish to anyone standing there. They didn't say, you owe me 10 bucks, you owe me 10, 15 dollars. They just gave fish to everyone. And that gave me the idea for a resource-based economy. But another source of information was the human body. If the brain said, I do all the thinking, I want most of the nutrients. If the lungs could talk, they'd say, if we don't oxygenate the blood, you die as a brain. So the brain says, well, what do you need? Everything you need. So the lungs get whatever it needs. The kidneys, all the organs of the body get whatever it needs. But if the brain took everything, you'd die in about a week. So I got the idea from the human body. I didn't get, people think I'm a communist or a socialist or a fascist, they call me everything. But I didn't get any ideas from that. I got it mostly from the human body and nature. Yes. Somebody want to walk over there with the microphone? Um, I was wondering about... Uh, uh, oh, um, I don't know. My body has stage fright. I don't know. My body has... Uh, no, I'm scared. <laughs> um, without money, uh, there won't be any reward for uh, work jobs that's unrewarding to do that we still have to do, like uh, taking care of all the sick people. Uh, I wonder if there's an idea how to solve that, because people probably won't want to work with it. Um, talking about incentive, there wouldn't be any, any incentive to do things such as taking care of older people. Most of today's work can be automated. 
We don't want people standing behind a counter like a woman spending most of her life, 30 years, standing behind a counter selling lipstick, hand you makeup, whatever they sell, waiting for people to come in and buy things. That's really a waste of the brain and a waste of lives. We can automate so many different things. You're talking about taking care of the elderly. There are a lot of people that volunteer today, even when they're out of work or they have work, they volunteer. There are people that care about other people in those positions, and they do take care of older people. But today, the incentive, they tell you the only incentive is the monetary system. The only incentive is money. Well, we're afraid of people that only have incentive for money. In the past, doctors used to take care of people because they really cared about it, about people today, mostly in America, I don't know about here, it's more socialized medicine, but it's a business in America. They have 15 minutes to drive people through. They can't talk to them any longer than 15 minutes. So we don't know when they say your kidney has to come out. We don't know if your kidney has to come out or the doctor's paying off a boat. When they send you to, to have tests in another lab, a lot of time the doctor has a connection and he owns part of that lab. So it's really very difficult to know what's real when money's involved. And the incentive in the future will be no crime, no poverty, no war, no hunger. If that's not incentive enough, then people are really ill. So Martin Luther King didn't march in the South when he believed in something because there was 50,000 bucks put in the Swiss bank for him. He did it because he felt that that was the right thing to do. That's, that's the type of incentive that we'll have in the future. It's, it, people are really ill today thinking that money is the only incentive. That means all the wealthy people would do nothing because they have money. I know a lot of wealthy people who say they don't have enough time in the day to do all the things that they want, and they don't need any money. But if you're alive, children are curious. They're curious about everything, and we kill that in them. So I, I think the thing that really hurts incentive the most is minimum wage. Hi. I want to begin by saying that the Venus Project is a beautiful thought that's really inspiring. Uh, my question is, um, how do you see the transition between a uh, monetary-based system and the resource-based system working in real life? How do we go from the monetary-based system to this? He's asking about the transition. How do you go from there to here? Okay. okay, that's always a good question. How do you get from here to the world I'm talking about? First of all, people have to lose their homes, their jobs, banks have to fail. Other than, other than that, they don't seem to concern themselves with it. This is not my wish. My wish is that people were smart enough to know that the system they live under is not secure. If they lose their homes, their cars, due to the banks failing or their jobs being phased out, that's the time they want to know, hey, what's wrong with the culture? They don't seem to respond unless they're all hurt by it. So now is the time to go on a world tour to present the Venus Project. I wish people were smart enough to know that without having things collapse and fail. But it seems there's never any social change unless people are hurt. I don't wish that on people. I'm just telling you the way it seems to be. But if we don't get enough information out there and people aren't aware of another direction, then they won't move towards it. So it's really important if you identify with this direction to learn as much as you can about it so you can answer questions and talk to people. So like Shaq said, now's the time to do that. Yeah, uh, why are people so afraid to uh, take in new transforming information? Why are people so afraid of taking in new information? I don't know if you know this, but if horses are raised in a barn and the barn catches fire and you pull the horses out, if you let them go, they run back into the barn. That was their only security they knew. 
And even though it's burning, normal people run back into the barn. It's the only system they know. Yeah, hi, I just wanted to ask you that. The, maybe we're concentrating too much on the actual monetary power, but what about the power of mankind over mankind? I mean, that is one of the biggest ones. And how are we supposed to fight it if it's a David and Goliath situation that we have? Uh, I mean, where's the first step? What about step? the power of mankind over mankind? A David and Goliath type of situation? Instead of just power, men's power over other men? Yeah. I mean, where does it come from? What about the need to fight that? How do you fight that? Not just the money system. Well, children will be raised in schools in the future with a different value system. You know, if you're brought up in a world of scarcity, you hide or you accumulate as much as you could to protect yourself or your family. But a world of abundance, you know, my parents came from a world of scarcity. So they say, eat everything in the plate. They're starving people elsewhere. But if you come from a world of abundance where you've never known scarcity, you leave half the food in your plate, you don't seem to concern yourself with those things. So it depends on the way you're brought up. If your father beat your mother a lot and he put you down, you might grow up saying, boy, I'm never getting married. It depends on where you're coming from, what you see that shapes your values. Also, when people have control other, over other people, they get something from it. They usually get resource reward from it. They're really ill, too. In the future, when somebody has that behavior, they'd be helped. There's no advantage in that behavior in a resource-based economy because you have access to anybody, to anything. You don't have to fight for human rights or women's rights or black rights because everybody has free access to the necessities of life. That's the end of fighting for human rights. Because today, what that is, is everybody wants a piece of the pie. If you don't understand that, in labor unions, if you make $50 a week, they go out on strike and they make $75 a week, the price of the car goes up. It's good for labor, but it's not good for the majority of people. So we don't work on any one area of society. We want to elevate every human being to their highest potential. Next question. Try to tighten your question so everybody gets a chance to ask a question. I've, Try I've, to yeah. get right to the point. Thank you. I, I actually have a lot of questions. I'm going to try my hardest to keep them as short as possible. First of all, thank Only you. Only one question, because a lot of people want I know, to ask I know, questions. I know. So I will try and keep it. And I, I, I would do want to reiterate on the how issue, because I don't think that was properly answered. I really do think that everyone here is here because they really want to do something for the change. And I don't think I am stuck at the how. Uh, it feels like we're 200 people in this audience, and we're fighting against 200 million people who are the masses, how do we convince those masses to go away from their traditional ways of life into a new phase in, uh, of humanity? How do we convince the people in power to, uh, to let go of that power? And how do we convince the people that are wealthy to let go of some of that wealth in, in order for everyone to I think I got your question. During the last depression, a friend of mine owned an aircraft factory. And the government approached him and said, we're taking your factory away from you. He said, why? Because you haven't paid taxes on your equipment in three years. He said, I have no orders for airplanes. Take the goddamn factory. A lot of factories, a lot of banks failed. And when they failed, Obama, unfortunately, took public funds and bailed them out. And they gave all that money to their friends. You have corruption in government. And your factories, when they fail, people lose control. There are a lot of industries that close when there's no water. If you own a farm and you grow a lot of food and people don't have the money to buy your food, your farm goes under. So the system itself dies. No system can perpetuate itself continuously. If you don't understand that, Poland believed in the cavalry. The Germans believed in war tanks. 
and they shot the hell out of the Poles on their horses. They lost millions of men and horses because they couldn't see the benefit of war tanks. The country, I'm not saying it's beneficial, the country that can't see the future, that has no vision of the future, will fall. Others will pass you. We have to be able to be flexible enough to change as time moves on. The future of the Venus Project has no fixed design. It's under constant change and growth. So you never become placid and say, this is the way of life that worked for me, and I'm going to keep it that way. Then you'll fall behind. A good way to introduce this direction to the general people and something that Jack and I want to do is a major motion picture so, or TV series to show what life in the future would be like that's palatable for the general public and then show how we get from here to there to make it real, to help answer the questions that people have. This is a, a, a great way for a saner transition we look at it kind of as social therapy to introduce a new direction to people. So you may think that you can't get much done by just talking to people, but it really is important that you learn about this direction, that you talk to people about it. If you're a musician, make music about it. If you, if you write, write about it. If you do artwork, do artwork about it. Mention the Venus Project or the Zeitgeist Movement. Do it in any form and way that you can. If you do radio shows, talk about it or have, or write to people who do radio shows and tell them you want to hear more about the Zeitgeist Movement or the Venus Project on the radio show. So we have to, we don't, Jacques and I don't have access to the media. We don't have money. We don't have power, but we work at it all the time. We put all our money into it. For the last 35 years, when I've been working with Jacques, we have outside jobs and put all our funding into making books, making videos. Nobody would publish our books. We, we made uh, the models, we shot the photographs, we edited the films. So there's a lot that has to be done to get the information out to people, and a lot of people are working at it any way that they can. And the question that you ask is how do you change people? When Edison invented the electric light, let's assume he did, uh, he had to educate people as to what it is. Nobody knew what it was. So if you have a new way of thinking, if you don't talk to people about your new way of thinking, no one will know about it. So you have to be good at it. So years ago I asked myself, how are you going to change the world? There's so many different value systems, different people have different concepts. I once asked Einstein whether he believed in God. He said, which one? <laughs> so so I, I never realized that people themselves have to have information. When you invent a power saw and a guy uses a hand saw, you have to show him how the power saw works. And if you've got a new social idea, if you don't talk to anybody about it, they will think in terms of the king ruling over people. Now, how do you get the king to have that power? The priest says, God put the king there to rule over you. The king loves that, so he keeps that priest in power. If a priest gets up and says, look, the king is no better than anybody else, his church is closed down. Or well, the king says, off with his head. In other words, the king controls things. And the church, if it doesn't conform to the social institutions it's in, it's closed down. Less people attend. Do you understand that? No. Okay. No. <laughs> you have to educate people to understand what you're talking about. Press the button. Um, okay, I'm interested in, um, like, more practically, how do we distribute goods and services to people? Do we have some form of, um, like, some government, or do we have a a bunch of unions or... How do you distribute goods and services? Do you have a government or like a bunch of unions? Do you, do you have no. yes, the question this? on distribution of goods and services. Yeah. In your body, there's a circulatory system and every organ gets whatever it needs. So the distribution centers have cumulative radios, laptops, whatever you need. 
you must understand that your laptop today is the best they know how to turn out today and make a profit. In the future, your laptop will be smaller, lighter, faster, take photographs, all kinds of things. So the future distribution center will have all these things on exhibit. And you can either watch that on 3D television and you can order whatever you feel you, feel you need. If you make things available to people, they don't steal. In the old days, there was more than enough water. If you live near a waterfall, nobody came at night and stole a canteen full of water. It's only when you run out of water that you pay for a buck for a glass of water. It's a start, the, they can't control the air you breathe, but it's absolutely necessary for life. But there's so much of it, nobody put a price tag on it. But I can assure you, if we begin to run out of air, you'll have to pay. They did in Japan for a while, you had a slot machine and you put a quarter in and you took five breaths of oxygen if the air were polluted. They can do anything they want to do. They'd love to control the internet. If they ever control the internet, you can kiss your ass goodbye. So you don't want that to ever happen. The internet is the greatest liberator ever invented. He was asking if there'd be labor unions. How do you distribute things? I said there's a center where you can get anything you want. You go there and it's like, it's not like the army, but in the army, if you need a new machine gun, if it doesn't work, you go to the center and pick one that does. Nobody charges you anything for it. If you have an airplane and the Germans invent a new airplane that's faster, the American Aviation Agency is given an assignment to make a faster plane. And the engineers are put there when you need a bridge in a certain area, you don't call the butcher or the baker, you call them bridge engineers. They don't control society, they just build bridges. Today, scientists make atom bombs, machine guns, technicians. So you always call upon people that are qualified to do that. You want to put a man on the moon, you don't call ordinary people who believe in a participatory democracy. They can't, we like to participate. Well, do you know how to make a rocket to get a man to the moon? No. Do you know how to feed people on a rocket ship? No. They can't participate, so you get rocket experts. So the government said to them, can you put a man on the moon? They said, we don't know. They said, what do you mean you don't know? We don't know what a human can stand. So they put him in the centrifuge and whirl him around. If a guy conks out, say at nine times gravity, they know the rocket can't take off 25 times that of gravity, and people would die. Then they don't know how to feed people in a rocket ship. If you give a man a glass of water, if you pull the glass away fast, the water will remain where it's at. Little bubbles will form. So you can't drink out of it. The water would go all over the place. There's no gravity. So they make a tube and they squeeze the water out. They put the food in the tube. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what they mean by I don't know. Now if a man lives in the space station for three months, they find out that the calcium begins to disappear in the bones. So they know that if, when a guy gets out of a spaceship, when he's been living in the space station, he can't even walk. He has to be given new food and rest. You can't know certain things. Like years ago, a man in France, long before the Wright brothers, built two wings. And each one was three feet long. That is about that long. And he jumped off the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower, and he died. And his brother-in-law wrote, make wings larger next time. <laughs> Where the hell do you think knowledge comes from? Mistakes. Now, they use the word mistake. Actually, no one ever makes a mistake. The guy that fooled with nitric acid and glycerin, the building disappeared, so did the guy. His brother-in-law wrote, never fool with that stuff. How do you know? You don't know. So that's why you never make a mistake in your life. When you fall in love at 16, it's different falling in love at 30. Your experience has changed. You look for something else. So when you say that person's right, that person's wrong, you're always wrong at a certain time in your life. Nobody likes what they've always done in life. So they learn. And when they learn, you can't say, well, you were stupid when you were 14. Well, you didn't have much experience at 14. 
Do you understand? Nobody ever does anything wrong. Now, if you lived in Italy and you had a sister and the guy looked at your sister with sexual intent, you beat the hell out of him. That's normal to Sicily. What's normal today is a little different. Do you understand? The word normal keeps changing as you become educated and learn new things. If you found out that all criminals were made by society, you wouldn't put them in jail, you'd correct that area of society that makes criminals. What's a criminal? Well, in the old days they said that a criminal was a person that took something out of your possession without your permission. Do you know what the new definition of a criminal is? One who's caught. Think about that. That's closer, isn't it? So if you do criminal things and you're never caught, you're never a criminal. So the whole idea of criminal is bullshit because all politicians are criminal. All military people kill. They're not called murderers. They're called defenders of the country. See, so when we stole the land from the Indians, we were murderers. We killed a lot of Indians, but we are not considered murderers because the nation said that's what you do. When the nation tells you to kill the goddamn Germans or the Swiss or the Greeks, they make it so that they look bad and you want to kill them. So they are the people that create the distortions. If your mother, say, is an old-time Baptist, and this kid named, uh, well, I'm talking about a guy that lived many years ago. Albert Fish. Uh, Albert Fish. Albert Fish. They believe he ate 45 children, and the public wanted to tear him to pieces. So a doctor, a psychiatrist, a brilliant one, said, don't kill him. I want to try to found, find out what made him that way. That's the most important thing, to get rid of the conditions that make serial killers. And this is what he found out. He left it out of his book, by the way. What he found out is that this kid was, when he was six or seven, he was touching his private parts. And the mother, being an old-time Baptist and sincere, she said, you're going to burn in hell touching that part of your body. The devil will torture you forever. So the kid was, began to tremble. And the mother says, at two in the morning, the kid was screaming. So she went into the bedroom. He stuck needles in his genitals because he didn't want to go to hell. I don't know if you can understand that. And he used to take minority kids into the woods, Mexicans, blacks and try to cut their generals off to save them from hell. What do you think a soldier is? A guy that's been distorted by the environment to want to kill other people. Do you understand that? If you bring up a kid in a malformed environment, say like the backwoods of the south, and he says, I'm going to give me a nigger and hang him upside down and cut his goddamn heart out. That means he was brought up in a distorted environment. Is he bad? Of course not. No one is good or bad. They're brought up on the conditions that make them that way. Can't you understand that? Think about it. Where do you get your, I pledge allegiance to the flag? If you were brought up in Germany, you pledge allegiance to the swastika. When a Jew sees a swastika, he spits. When a German sees it, he gets a lump in his throat. Sadness. That's my country. So, the difference between people is the environment they come from. If you don't understand that, to make an architect, you have to put them in an architectural environment. To make a doctor, you put them in a medical environment. Isn't that true? To make anybody, you have to put them in an artistic environment to make an artist. That helps. So, if we don't have an environment that educates us, we will go on doing stupid and foolish things. Questions? Hello, my name is Eva, and uh, I'm wondering if uh, the Venus Project is uh, registered with this organization. Can uh, anyone become a member of uh, the Venus Project? And one uh, other short uh, question is, uh, do you organize any free lectures for people who, for example, can afford for a uh, ticket or who don't have uh, free access to internet, so they can learn this way about the Venus Project? Or, for example, lectures in school to reach children and youth from the beginning, so they so they know about the Venus Project as well. Thank you. Your first question, is it a, a membership organization, the Venus Project? Well, the activist arm of the Venus Project is called the Zeitgeist Movement. Peter Joseph did a film 
called Zeitgeist Addendum, which introduced the Venus Project to the world, really, because it was put on the internet for free. And um, since that happened, we developed the Zeitgeist Movement, which is a membership organization. And there are member memberships all over the world. There are chapters all over the world. So um, I think Navid is going to get up after and talk about the Zeitgeist Movement, if you're interested in joining. Um, and your other question, are, are there free lectures? Um, we live in the monetary system today. Jacques and I are not sponsored by anyone. So in order to continue, we have a 21-acre research center where we, where we work, where we make the models, where we make the books and videos, where we give lectures. And in order to support that, that center, we have to charge. We pay for the travel, we pay for the hotels, we pay for the venues, we're on this lecture tour. So we have to charge in order to pay for these things. And not every venue comes out where we have a profit. Sometimes we pay to go and lecture. So um, we just can't afford to lecture for free. Unfortunately, we are prostitutes in this system as well, and we have to live and feed ourselves. So we do have to charge. I always look at people buying our books. Sometimes they say, why are you charging for the books when you're advocating a resource-based economy? I always look at people buying the books as their little contribution to this direction. Because we, as I said, we have been supporting it for so many years. Um, I wish we had some outside funding. People say, well, can you give the books away? And I say, well, if you can give us $1,000, we'll give away $1,000 for the books, gladly. But otherwise, we carry it all ourselves. We can't. Yeah, we can't afford to carry it ourselves. So, um, and then you asked about, is there information in schools or somebody who doesn't have the internet? I, we put out a lot of free ebooks on our, our website. We put out a lot of free information on the website. It's very extensive. And also, the, the Zeitgeist Movement website is very extensive also, and there's a lot of things to do and join and work with people. Um, so we, we, don't, we would like to put out information in schools, and, and we're getting more and more of that, actually. People are writing about the Venus Project in their textbooks. We have several countries who have that information in their textbooks. There, there are people who have written children's books about the Venus Project in collaboration with Jacques, too. So we would like to have more information out there. If you have any access to that, we'd be glad to talk to you about that. I want to say something else. It takes me about two and a half years to build the models for this 12-minute film that you saw. I have to make them. And I have to, for two and a half years, I have to eat, pay rent, taxes on our acreage, and the 10 buildings we both paid for. Nobody else paid for them. So we have to have air conditioning in the camera storage areas, because the cameras won't last if we don't do that. So we have no other way of living in this system. There's no angel that comes down and says, what do you need, Jock? You know, we have to pay for it. We're so, looking for them. We'd like to do the first city and the film, so if you know anyone. <laughs> we can't do it on our own. We need your help. This is the truth. Yes. So, I have a very uh, quick question. question. What will the houses in the Venus Project be made of? And is it enough material to build these houses? Well, what will the houses in the Venus Project be made of? And is there enough materials to build them. Okay. The houses will be made of composites that don't burn, that do not fall in case of an earthquake. We have rebars built all through the material, and we use the memory metals. How many of you are familiar with the memory metals? Well, you may have seen it on our website. How many of you have actually seen the memory metals? About three people. After the lecture, if you want to see them, do you have I them? don't have a hair dryer. <laughs> I'm I sorry. Have do you have the metal with you? Yeah, nothing okay. can make it go better. We can do it in hot water. Oh, okay. Anyway, the memory metals are nickel and titanium. If you shake them, shape them in the shape of a building, and then you twist them and bend them out of shape, 
If you heat it, it goes back to the building shape. And if you shape a chair with the memory metals, the right curves, then flatten it out and ship 5,000 chairs to Egypt. When it gets here, you connect two electrodes or heat it, it goes back to the contour. So if you make a dome building and then flatten it out and ship 5,000 buildings to China, there they heat it and it takes a minute and a half, it goes back to the building shape. So this new memory metal, and now they make a memory fabric. A surgeon ties a surgical knot in the metal, in the fabric. Then he straightens it out again, cuts the skin, sticks it through straight, and the heat of the body causes to tie a surgical knot. You have to tie the surgical knot first, then the memory material goes back, like the crease in this pants has a memory. You can wash it, and the crease still remains. So in the future, they say, well, who's going to do the dirty work? They always pick somebody digging ditches or something like that. We got machines today that can be guided by satellite to any position within six inches from a thing 3,000 miles up in space. It can guide your automobiles. Your Aunt Minnie doesn't have to drive downtown. If you can move tractors on a farm automatically, surely we can drive Aunt Minnie's car downtown. And if you put proximity devices on the car, if your Aunt Minnie or somebody got angry at her and wanted to drive into her car, it would stop 40 feet away. We used to have, some of you remember this, elevators where women mostly used to turn a crank and they never quite got to the floor. They had to work it up and down. Today, you press 20 and the elevator stops right on the 20th floor without a human being. If you go to any modern airport, there are trains no conductors, no operators, those trains stop in line with a wall and the door is open. You can't even fall on the tracks now. There's a wall. And so, if we can do that automatically, people say to me, can machine ever be better than the designer? I want to try to answer that. I know a little guy that designed a machine to pick up a freight car and empty it. He can't do that. I know aeronautical engineers design airplanes to fly at 2,000 miles an hour in space, 18,000 miles an hour. He can't run 18,000 miles an hour. Machines almost always surpass the performance of the designer. Now let's take a bottling factory. There are nozzles that fill 40 bottles at one time. The designer can't do that. And the production line moves faster than he can move the bottles. So when they say, well, how smart are machines? Well, when you look out of an airplane in the old days, you say, I'm about a mile high. Today, with Doppler radar, it says you're 5,300 feet, six inches off the ground. No human can do that. So it isn't machine takeover. The machines are now assigned in airliners to give you the height. Then with radar, you can hit the moon, bounce back, and get distances very close. About nine months ago, machines were able to handle 1,000 trillion bits of information per second. I know of no group of humans that can do that. So when I say machine government, I'm not talking of a machine takeover. They will be assigned those decisions, machines. Just like the butcher used to grab a chicken and say, it's about six pounds. The guy buying it says, it looks more like four pounds. So then he made a scale. You put the chicken on it, and the scale is far more accurate than any human being fielding a chicken. So is it a machine takeover? No. They will be assigned in the future government positions. Why? Because their tentacles are in every area of farming, transportation. So if you wanted to ship 500 cars to New Orleans, the machine will tell you you can. The bridges are washed out. You understand? It isn't that the machines take over. No machine ever took over. No machine wants to take over. These are human attributes. If you don't understand me, if you've got a laptop and you smash it in front of 20 brand new laptops, Yes, we'll get you. If it isn't this week or next week, we'll get you. Machines don't care. They don't want to take over. This is Hollywood showing robots choking the guy. 
Machines don't have feelings, they don't care. If you work your little laptop Saturday, Sunday, Monday, give me a day off, God damn it. You know, it doesn't have those feelings. This is Hollywood at work. And Hollywood writers write about the future, so you have spaceships with men killing each other with laser weapons. That is not the future. I'm sorry, that but is... you didn't answer my question, Paul. Do we have enough of this material? We have more than enough. Have it in titanium and nickel, because this is very rare materials, actually. Let me say it again. We have more than enough to take care of everybody on Earth at this time. But if we have a shortage of anything, you have to listen, sir. If we have a shortage of anything, it's very easy for science to make a substitute material. There's no shortage of anything except brains in Washington. Now you ask a specific question. He did. He did. We'll take another question if you have people who want to ask questions. Okay. Hey, um, I understand your criticism of the monetary system as it presently exists, but without the price system of individual decisions guiding economic production, what is going to determine the amount of goods and services produced, what kinds of goods and services produced, and so forth? Today, it's arbitrary what's produced. They make the factory, they build things, and they hope that there's going to be an economic boom so they'll sell, or they keep things back until the economy's higher and then they'll put it on the market so they'll make more. This is a terrible way of distributing goods and services, the monetary system, obviously because most people don't have what they need. So in the future, the system is built for the benefit of people, which is different today than making a buck. So what needs to be done is a survey first to find out what we have, how many resources we have, where they are, where the clean water is, where the technical personnel are, where the, the factories are, where the sicknesses are, where people are, are located, where arable land is. We have to find out what we have first and that determines what we build. It's actually the needs of people determine what's built and where. If you have people who are sick in one area, then that determines how many, how many hospitals go in that area. It's not arbitrary. Nobody sits down and thinks, hmm, I'll, I'll put a factory out here because I'll get a kickback from that when I sell certain things, or I have land here and I'll, I'll put a high rise here so I'll make more money on that. Today, the, the, the decisions are not for the benefit of people. In the future, it will be people's needs that determine how the decisions are arrived at. They're not made. They're based on statistical data. If you don't understand that, if you uh, say, bring everybody up to believe that everyone should have a right to their own opinion. I'm sure that most of you have been brought up that way. If you live across the street from me and I see 10 guys going into your apartment, I can have all kinds of opinions. She could be a language instructor, a ballet instructor, an art instructor, but if you give everybody a right to their own opinion, you damage society. You ask the average person, you think years ago, you think man will ever get to the moon? Nah, not in a thousand years. Is he a student of space travel? Does he know anything about rockets? No. You just give people the right to their own opinion and they damage the future. There were scientists in the future that violated the scientific method. They said man will never be able to fly. They should have said, I can't conceive of how to design a flying machine. Will we ever get to Mars and colonize it? Colonize it? I don't know enough about space travel. I don't even know how to design survival systems for Mars. Just say, I don't know. Don't say, nah, not in a thousand years. When you give everybody a right to their own opinion, you damage the future. You have to think about what I'm saying. I don't want to deny people the privilege of thinking. Just learn how to say, I don't know. That's the most difficult thing for the average person to learn. I don't know. Another question? Thank you.
question when I saw about the marine fish farms in your presentation. And I think if you say the military is unnecessary killing, isn't meat eating unnecessary killing too? Because we can evolve other methods of living without needing to kill anyone. So what do you think about the idea of creating a better world for all beings on Earth and not just people? Is because meat eating unnecessary killing as well? Watch out. Meat, meat eating, unnecessary killing as well. She started thinking about it when she saw your fish farms. Oh, okay. Um, a man named Surajagata Chandabose in India found out that a cucumber was six times as sensitive to pain as a human being. Now, of course, I'm a vegetarian. They assume that vegetables don't feel anything. You can get the book called Response in the Living and Non-Living. I didn't know that. I used to be a vegetarian because I didn't want to kill animals or fish. But you live on living plants, tissue, animals. You're alive. Your weight depends on what you eat. So if you eat vegetables or living systems, you live on living systems. And you convert animal tissue to human tissue. So the guy named Bose, get the book response in the living and non-living. I used to think as you did, that I don't want to kill animals, I'm going to be a vegetarian. I used to think, well, what the hell does a vegetable feel? You know, I didn't know that they felt things. Now it's up to you. After you read that book, you tell me what you want to do. Who decides what's right or wrong? Can she eat her friends if she's hungry? <laughs> you won't have any friends anymore. <laughs> Actually, I can only say this, that to make a cow takes tons of food to make one cow. You can feed more people if you use vegetables. So I would say that not to feed cows or cattle or animals, they take more food produce an animal than it does vegetables. So for efficiency point of view, I would say that plants may be more sensitive to pain, but they are not broad enough to devise anything. So we have to use that measure. What can a man do? What can a plant do? What can an animal do? And an animal has more sensitive areas of pain in a wider range. So those would be the criteria that kind of thing of the future. I would say that in the future, people will not make decisions. They will arrive at them. Like, uh, who makes the decisions under the Venus Project? The answer, no one. They take samples of the soil from all over the world, analyze it, and by the contents of the soil, they say, you can grow uh, bamboo for three years, then you have to rotate the sugar cane. They give you their findings, not their opinion. So I'm not too interested in the opinions of people. I'm interested in what do you know, what have you found out about that, and we go along with that. There also has to be a lot of studies in the future. We, we really, science is so tainted today with the monetary system that when, when they have studies, you don't know who's paying it off and who wants to get a certain outcome to sell a product. So there really is very little real science today, especially in the medical field. It, it's really difficult to tell what's going on. They buy off the doctors to say certain things about certain pharmaceutical products. They buy off the, the science magazines in order to put certain things in it. So. There's going to be a lot of new research in the future as to what really is good for you, what you need at certain times of life, what kind of nutrients and food is better for maybe for different types of people. So there's just going to be a lot of different research in the future that's real scientific research. And that'll always change when they learn more things. Nothing's fixed, but, but it's always changing as we learn new things. As I heard from you, you said it's a lack of good brains in Washington. And that is politics, I think. I think we need ethical leaders 
if something could be changed. Uh, don't you think we must start with the most practically chosen good leaders such as Mandela and... Uh, and um, Do you think we should start with good leaders in politics such as Mandela to make change? Mandela doesn't know what to do. He's a very nice guy, very humanistic, but he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to do it. Mandela, um, I'm going to say this, Castro uh, said that Americans own most of the hotels in Cuba, the whorehouses, the gambling casinos, so he kicked them out. And he put all the poor people in the hotels. Then he came to America and says, I need money to change Cuba. And America said, only if you give back the material took away from people. He said, no. Now, Russia said, we'll give you a million dollars a day to try to build up Cuba. So he, he got that money from Russia. And he ordered 5,000 tractors from Cuba. It isn't tractors that you need. What you needed was wheels and a power unit and a tram so you can pull many vehicles. Castro didn't know that, so Cuba remained in a static state for years. And Cuba offered to send doctors to uh, New Orleans when the hurricane struck out, when they had problems, and we refused to accept Cuban doctors, free of charge. So is Castro bad? Is he good? Well, he did the best he knew up to now. So I went to Cuba years ago, and I'd help any country, by the way, fascist or otherwise, in, in solving problems. So I went to Cuba to see if I can help. And I said, I'd like to see Fidel Castro. The minute I said that, they took my luggage, examined it, made sure it didn't have any guns or knives in it. I understood that. And they said, uh, uh, you can't see Castro because he's out cutting sugar cane with the workers. He wanted to be one of the boys. So I said, can I get to the University of Havana? Well, they arranged so I got to the university. I want to speak to the technicians there to tell them what to do. So they said in their dialect, Vita Freco, we don't have the technology America has, so we cannot do these wonderful things. I says, you don't need it. You jack up a car, put a belt on the rear wheel, and you can cross a sugar cane. You can move conveyor belts with the rear wheel of a car. Oh, you have to see Fidel. I says, I can't see Fidel. Can you bring him over here? Well, he's working in the sugar cane field. Well, they had no communication. So I spent 600 bucks, which I had practically no money. I stayed in Cuba as long as I can. They took me to the banana plantations where the men were carrying bananas down the hill. So I said, if you put a clothesline up there, hook the bananas on, they'll come down automatically. Oh, you have to see Fidel. <laughs> I said, I can't see Fidel. Can you arrange it? They had no way of arranging it. I had help any country. I went to Haiti years ago and brought them surgical instruments from friends of mine, doctors and dentists that had updated their instruments and they gave me used instruments to give to the Haitians. But the government was so corrupt, they said it's going to cost you $200 to give us those instruments. That is how corrupt they were. It was the most corrupt country, possibly second to America. <laughs> So I couldn't even give out the instruments. Do you understand? So it's hard to be decent and good in this world. Yes. Question. This person had his hand up for hours. Oh, sorry. Uh, I wonder how aesthetics uh, fits into the uh, Venus project. Does aesthetics fit into the Venus project? Right. Does aesthetics fit into the Venus project? You know, um, if you were raised as an Indian in, in America, to you, the teepee would, could be the most beautiful thing there is. And if they see a home made out of concrete, they might not like it. Aesthetics and notions of beauty depend on your background. If you were raised in some of these villages where the women put this big plaque on the bottom of their lip, they cut the lip and it, plaque gets bigger and bigger as they stretched it. 
The man might come on and fall in front of her and say, oh, your eyes, your ears, your big lip. Do you know what I mean? Beauty depends on your background, what's beautiful, what's aesthetic. To me, since I've learned about the Venus Project, the designs that Jack has are very aesthetic, but because they're honest, they're very efficient, they use resources wisely, they're not a monument to somebody's ego, as most architecture is today. His architectural designs for his cities correlate with the direction of, of a resource-based economy, with the social direction to conserve energy, make things strong, efficient, so they be updated. So, um, so really, everybody can have a high standard of living. There's no ornamental waste, there's no little um, ornamental wrought iron things in front of windows that do nothing, that just get blown off in a hurricane or big um, shingles on the roof, you know, the tiles that they use in Florida a lot that, that really kill people in hurricanes. So you, you consider all that and what's efficient for the city of the, for the it's social architecture really. So to me, that's aesthetic because it's honest and real. Your notions of what's aesthetic change as you learn things. For example, there was a chair called the Kennedy Rocker because President Kennedy bought a rocking chair. If you ever sat in it, you'll find a sore butt. It doesn't work. What you need an anatomist to design furniture so it contours with the human body, not some artist that draws a pretty chair, you sit on it and hurts your butt in 10 minutes. So in the future, clothing will not be designed by artists. They'll be designed by anatomists and physiologists. So when you rip your arm, it doesn't pull, it yields. And the clothing you wear today, you guys go like that, because it's uncomfortable. Clothing should be designed by people that study the human body and how it works in relation to it. Today, your culture is so mixed up, they even change the style of the dresses in the spring, in the fall, so you'll buy new things. They want our consideration, is it healthy to have clothing designed the way it is? Does the hat really do things? Does the hat really turn the body cool? So some anatomist named Spencer, a scientist, he wanted to know what life is. He says, what is life? People ask him. He says, when the major aspect of living systems is how the body automatically adjusts to temperature. Meaning if it gets very hot, you sweat, the body cools. If it gets very cold, you burn up more fat. He says, a living system adjust automatically to temperature differences. And an engineer said to Spencer, you know, that's exactly what my refrigerator does. When it gets hot, it gets cooler. Is it alive? Well, Spencer had to change his definition. <laughs> See, the trouble with, with us is that we don't have a broad enough description. What is life? Both taught us that there's response in the living and non-living, that the copper wire, if you put a candle underneath it, responds as though it had pain, in the same way that living stuff. So you gotta scratch your head and say, what is pain? What is living, non-living? Is the sun alive? Of course not. But without the sun, all the plants would die. So we're connected to nature. You don't see the electric cords coming out of human beings, but we're connected to everything. And if we don't learn to face things honestly, if we say dishonestly that man is the highest form of evolution, which you get in your school, man destroys the oceans, the fish, the atmosphere, one another, in the name of God, they've killed more people than any other system, religion and man flies over a city, presses a button, and burns everybody in the city with nuclear weapons. Is he the highest creation of nature? Not yet, in my opinion. We've got a long way to go. We could either develop paradise on earth or oblivion, wipe ourselves out. Only the future will tell. It's what you do to make the future.